Welcome to podcast 172. Today, I am joined on the Wiggly Sofa by a plethora of guests. Actually, we've had to have two Wiggly Sofas brought in especially to house them all. Um, Today on the Wiggly Sofa, we have... Richard. And sat, sat uncomfortably close to Richard, Farmer Phil. And we'd like to welcome a doctor. <laughs> but not a medical doctor, Nikki Cannon. Excellent. And you're from? Dorset, from Shaftesbury. Avenue? No. No, not the Avenue. Absolutely the not. slightly more rural version. And Nikki is an Uffield Scholar in the same year as me. And your study topic, Nikki, was? Was the sustainability of organic and conventional farming systems. And you have one minute to talk on that subject <laughs> starting now. Only joking. And we've also got Corrine, and she's from Brittany. Welcome, Corrine. Oh, thank you very much. And she has got the best French accent <laughs> on earth. And you're studying as an Uffield Scholar... About the sustainability um, in the dairy farmer. And you're a dairy farmer? Yes, I am. How many cattle? Uh, I have 100 cow. And so you get up early every single day? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and here we go. We'll get Corinne to read out the Wiggly Review. John, the regular ether farmer Phil and quite possibility... Special finest Ricardo Feischborn as they discuss very informatively the ups and downs for rural affairs. Relaxed, good humoured, well produced, and very interesting. Keep up the good work. Oh, oh, my God. Like that. That music to my ears. <laughs> Sparshot's finest. Sparshot's finest. Where did that come from, that review then? Is that it someone that knows more about me than I I'd possibly John know? John O'Jay, and it says uh, it's a five star and it's compulsive listening. And before mm. we get on to the real meat of the podcast, we've got another four star review from the son of the goddess which I think he's reviewed before and he's put Phil's cows and it says saddened to hear of Phil's mysterious bovine mortality syndrome (laughs) an associate orphan offspring the angst and frustration was audible in his voice one hopes that by podcast 171 tranquility and peace has returned to the farm superb pod and sprinkles life and vitality whenever I listen. And how are the cows, Farmer Phil? Well, hopefully, touch wood, fingers crossed, we are over the problem. That's not to say that we haven't sort of suffered along the way in as much that we have, but currently things look to be improving. Happy cows. Happy cows. Okay, we've waited forever, haven't we, Rich, to get somebody into organics on this sofa who knows a thing or two about yeah, yeah, yeah. it. I mean, it's much better to have someone here that, uh, that knows what they're talking about <laughs> rather than, <laughs> rather than <laughs> all this and having to suffer Phil and I chat about, uh, especially me, chat you about have no so much. I'm no <laughs> idea what Just speak about. for yourself. So it's, so it's wonderful to have, it's wonderful to have a professional food. person on board that can talk about uh, farming in a subjective way. So, indeed. Great stuff. So you came up uh, yesterday, Nikki, did you? And, That's uh, right, yes. And you stayed with the, uh, with the Goranges last night? Yes. Did yes. they treat you well? The wine tastes very nice, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it does. So you had a good night. And you just, uh, you, you're going back to Dorset today? or? No, we're going to visit another Nuffield scholar on the way back. Okay. Um, so a good, doing a good old Nuffield tour around. Yes. Been trained well for over the last two years. Fabulous. You must have enjoyed your, your Nuffield scholarship. It's a fantastic experience, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And met some good. interesting people, evidently. We had a fantastic group of scholars who's remained a good group of friends, really, isn't it? I think so. And you went on a right adventure, didn't you, to Kenya? 
Yes. Just as the election was on. Yes, I managed to go there on the brink of civil war, but thankfully didn't get involved in the fighting too much myself. <laughs> yeah, <I guess>, you know, <laughs> that's quite reassuring. I can't say it helped with looking at farms, seeing as you couldn't hire a car at the time because there was no petrol. But oh, right, okay. I, I did manage to get around a lot before that and so a wide variety. And you did farms. expose your three small children to a green mamba. Yes, my three-year-old daughter, I was having her afternoon nap when a green mamba entered the bedroom. (laughs) I'm afraid it went out in three pieces after um, initially they tried to kill it with a bow and arrow. And that didn't work because it's a very thin snake, although the tenth most poisonous snake in the world. But it went it was put into three pieces by a piece of four by two in the end. Four by two by four by two. (laughs) About (laughs) two one. (laughs) She was perfectly reasonable. Take no chances. Listen, let's have a bit of the Nikki history. You're a lecturer at the Royal Agricultural College at Simoncester. That's right. You've got a PhD. You've got all these things. Give us a bit of, we need street cred, babe. You know, you could be anyone sat there. Yeah, I was brought up on a beef and sheep farm in East Sussex, which wasn't organic, but we were typical of the area where we were slightly inland and we farmed marshes and... There was, as far as a low-input system, that was what it was. Anyway, there was no place for me on the farm, and I went and did a degree in agriculture at Y College and then decided to study for a PhD, and I looked at integrating livestock back into arable systems, so sheep grazing, wheat, and then took it on to how that affects the quality of organic wheat so we still need to be able to produce a good loaf of bread and those kind of factors and uh, really enjoyed that and came much more of a croppy person after that realized that I didn't want to work in animal experimentation and so I then worked as organic consultant for a while and helped farmers on an EU project who wanted to convert to organics. That was over in East Anglia. And there are farmers over in East Anglia who, who farm using those methods and very well. And then my husband became a farm manager for a large estate in Oxfordshire. So we moved to Oxfordshire. And I went to the Royal Agricultural College just to step in for someone who was ill to do some lectures. And nearly seven years later... I'm there now as a lecturer in crop sciences, but I cover all the organic aspects of the courses and also crop production and plant growth factors. Okay. How long did it take you to do your doctorate? Three years, and three normally years. three years if you. I suppose get is, on is it possible it. to sort of wrap it in a nutshell, the, the, the conclusions of your findings in that kind of the symbiotic relationship between livestock and arable farming? It can be successfully done, but you've got to understand plant physiology to know. And that's the same with any farming system. You've got to be aware of what stage a crop is at and how you can damage it. But more interestingly, I started looking at the way that wheat competes against weeds. And that's the main factor that restricts organic growing, is the competition being wrong and weeds taking over. And obviously you've got to have, um, you can't go out and, and hand rogue out all these weeds. Then looking at delaying sowing, which is more what my grandfather would have done as a farmer, mm. whereas most conventional farmers are sowing from mid-September onwards wheat. Organically, you wouldn't be sowing it till mid-October. Right. And interestingly then, the forage value of wheat becomes a lot less because you don't ha- the plant isn't so developed when it goes into the winter. For sheep to graze, they need something there to graze. You still get some good, good grass out of it or good forage, yeah. but you must take the sheep off the land before the growing point comes through because initially the plant's vegetative and then it goes into its reproductive stage right. of putting an ear of wheat up. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. That's interesting stuff, isn't it? Yes, it is. Fascinating. I'm presumably you find it fascinating, Phil. Mm. I mean, it's, uh, I suppose to a degree that's something you're sort of involved in or you do engage in it. At well, of course, from our point of view, because we are a mixed farm, so we've already integrated animal production with arable production mm. in as much that we use the byproducts of our arable farming to feed the cattle in the wintertime mm. it's already to some extent integrated i think where nikki's coming from is something that we don't actually do for contamination reasons but is using the animal byproducts as fertilizer for the arable farming because organic arable farming on its own is not sustainable without bringing in some sort of fertility 
either via rotation, animals, or some other source of fertility. Otherwise, the fertility just declines until it won't grow anything at all in some cases. And so that, that's quite interesting to me because we are told that some of these s- systems are sustainable and some are and some aren't. And it, it's an example of conventional farming learning lessons from organic experimentation. Hmm. It's an interesting thing, uh, Nikki. I, I can draw the parallels between, uh, between you and Heather uh, because you possibly will have both. I mean, certainly I know Heather has, has given Phil a hard time on many occasions because of his reluctance to, to even um, consider organic methods as, as being anything. Hold on, I than, consider them. Other than I've the, just rejected other, them. <laughs> ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, having had a, a husband who was previously and still is to a degree engaged with conventional farming, did you find yourself sort of arguing the good argument in, in many instances that he, he possibly needed to compromise his behaviours at times? So much that you've got to be able to make a living and to go organic, um, the business he was involved with was predominantly arable Mm. and the livestock lived on the permanent pasture so there was a lot of parkland around the big house and Mm. we had as much grassland as we could use without and where organics comes in is out of six years of growing crops Two of those years you'd be in fertility building crops such as grass clover lays, which you need to utilise in some way by livestock. And we had more grass than we could deal with already without getting more stockmen involved and then that involves housing people and further investments. And the livestock sector's been, you know, the returns haven't been that reliable to make that investment. So I could understand why he carried on producing conventionally and often thought about perhaps putting a section of the farm into organics and seeing how it gets on. But it's difficult separating off part of the farm because you have to have grain storage and sufficient resources to be able to do that. And many farms haven't got that option. Sure. So conversion is a lot harder sometimes than people think for farmers. Right. And Often they will take some of the principles of organic farming and use those to reduce their inputs or improve their soil organic matter, but they can't do the whole system. And it is a big change to do the whole system. Right. When you talk about organic farming, I mean, it's something that, uh, that we, uh, perhaps I should reiterate now, that we, we have often uh, mentioned uh, the expression organic, and I've always tried to get away from the fact that um, organic, the, the, whole, the word seems to be associated with the soil association especially, specifically even. Um, But you were talking earlier on that you thought wider of the expression organic. Yes. Organics is a legally defined word by an EU regulation. And in the UK we've got, I think it's eight certification bodies ranging from organic farmers and growers, organic food federation, regional ones, Welsh have QWSC who certify to organics, SOPA, who do the Scottish organic producers, and even the biodynamics, and they still have an organic certification standard. Right. And they all are as organic as one another. It is a legally defined term. And that's another job I do for DEFRA. We work on the certification committee, which is how the certification bodies meet the organic standards within the UK to check that basically it's not an inspector going onto a farm and someone says here's a tenor just say I'm organic it's rigorously checked to make sure that they are doing their job and efficiently maintaining those standards. How has the EU possibly adopted the word organic when you and I both know that organic is live and natural you know what a mad world it is that the yeah. EU has got a regulation that means that you're organic when actually you, Nikki Cannon, are organic in yourself. I completely agree with you and I think it goes back to Lady Eve Balfour and the movement that started back then and now it's been recognised as an international word although Corrine would refer to it as biological, mm-hmm. organic farming ah. and, and some people would call it ecological farming and so it, European wise different people use different terms but we've adopted the phrase organics and I think it's going to be pretty hard to change that because it's got a set image in our mind Now you've managed to take quite a lot of the emotion out of this discussion because usually we get all fretty 
about organic or well, not. Because I don't. <laughs> no, no, of course you don't, know, Sean. <laughs> Just silly of me to even think that. <laughs> um, one day they had yeah. a fight. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that sheepskin's between. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you've taken the emotion out of it. Yeah. But underneath it all, have you not got a set of values that? that you want to apply to your own life and to the lives of other farmers. You know, you're a teacher, you're a lecturer. Isn't your lecture about how you must have this set of values and why it's so important? Or was that before the Nuffield? Where were you two years ago in your heart? In my heart, I always knew that organic was a management option for a farmer. It's a decision they take. And you often find that farmers have gone into it for a variety of reasons. It's not like a religious transformation where (laughs) one day they're sitting there on the sofa and this word organic flashes past them and then they're dedicated down this route. It's something like Corinne, I think, is going through for her business, a decision of is this where we should, how we should be producing food? Can we make more money out of this? Will our, our livestock be happier? Will it make our life better or, or the environment around us? And I think farmers have gone an awful long way in the last few years of realising the, what they can do environmentally for their farm. Phil and I were discussing what Set Aside did for farmers, that it made them realise that their farm wasn't solely about productivity and that bits of the farm were better for other reasons, for, for wildlife. You tend to find at the moment we've got a grant to help farmers convert So they get a payment for the 24-month conversion period. And then they get a maintenance payment per hectare. And if they do all the sums and they realise this is going to work for them, they often start this conversion route, and often for financial reasons. But when doing it, they start to realise that perhaps their soil is more alive. I always remember when we first went on to the estate in Oxfordshire, and dug a hole in the field and a friend said to my husband, what do you see? And I was like, well, soil. He said, what don't you see? He said, well, there's no compaction, that's fine. And it's all, and the answer was worms. And worms are, I mean, I'm now talking to the converted, (laughs) obviously, but worms are a vital part of the soil and they're something that have kind of left vacant possession, really, of the land. And we'd like to see them occupying the land again. And once you start using grass clover lays, like we mentioned, which have to be utilised by something so stock or even poultry, then you realise that the soil organic matter starts to build up again. And And when you have organic matter, that's the crux of the farming system, really, because soils are better able to buffer against um, drought and against heavy rainfall incidents. They're able to hold nutrients better and generally respond. And so instead of having the system where you put fertiliser on, it becomes in solution in the soil, the plant takes it up and that's how it grows. Instead, the thing that we all learnt at school, the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, all these factors come in. And that's what it's all about, mm. about making nature work in the way it should be and being a fully engaged system yeah. rather than just using the soil as a medium to put a plant in and to harvest it afterwards. What you've actually described has sort of crystallised the thought in my head because for my part as a conventional farmer... The decision as to go down <clears throat> a particular production method, whether it be to an organic standard or to a farm assured standard, and there are obviously aspects of all of these things which will benefit each other. It's when the organic standard is marketed to the consumers as something that I believe that it's not. And we had the conversation that they talk about conventionally grown wheat contaminating an organic sample, but they never talk about conventional wheat being contaminated by an organic sample and the idea that organic farming is marketed as no pesticides, no chemicals and no drugs, it's blatantly untrue. As a farmer, that's where it goes wrong to me. My choice is to take production methods and, you know, the building of organic matter in the soil. It is this unknown, the bit that gives you that good crop that is not just related to the fertiliser or the inputs you've put on it, but it's that better crop 
you know, we discovered with set aside that if you plough up set aside, you usually get a really good crop afterwards. Of course you do, because you haven't taken any fertility out of it for a year or more before. But is that a fair accusation, Nikki, that organic is marketed as no pesticides, no chemicals, no what's it, when actually that's not the case? Is he right there or is he wrong? If you look up the definition of organic farming that's been very difficult to do, it's a huge long definition. It's not simply farming in the absence of synthetic fertilisers and pesticides. It talks about words like nutrient cycling, ecology, and works all these factors together to create a farming system that produces good crops. And I'm, the last thing I'm into is organic farmers bashing conventional farmers and vice versa. They both need to learn from one another. We're not going to feed the world through organic farming, but we're not feeding the world through conventional production. It's politics and economics that aren't feeding the world. Corinne, you're looking at the possibility of changing your dairy farm to an organic method. Why? Because uh, I'm not agree with with my job. I think I can improve myself to be happy to keep a dairy farmer and to have a, a better way of life. What will make it better? The soil, the cows, the money? Maybe a lot of what you say. Uh, Everything. Yeah, because um, I do the job since uh, 1995. I know perfectly what I do, and uh, I need to do something else. I need to improve myself and try to do something better. Any snuffling that you can hear is Alice, small child, who, when she grows up, informs me that she's going to be a... What are you going to be, Alice, when you grow up? A butterfly. Is that something? Or a moth? Yes. We could do it into. Oh yeah, she's she's actually not sure whether she's going to be a butterfly or a moth, depending on whether she wants to be a nighttime or a daytime. Yeah, but I think I think you'll find it. You'll probably be both at times, Alice. (laughs) (laughs) But um, organic farming finds it hard to prove that their food is healthier and they definitely want to use that marketing stance and a few studies have proven that organic food is healthier than conventional food or contains more nutrition but they can never get a conclusive result that the scientists are happy to use that standard so I think it's the Food Standards Agency won't let them use that as as a definition. But I do think that organic farming has some um, definite advantages in terms of, like Phil said, you get a better crop after set aside. And by using the natural fertility, it might be slower growing and more natural based growing systems that therefore tastes. That's why people sometimes perceive them as tasting slightly healthier. Well, in fairness, uh, I mean, it's it's a fairly widely agreed fact that if you reduce the yield of a crop that the nutrients within it or you know in the case of wheat if you have a poor yield of wheat usually the protein is higher so if you have a huge yield the protein goes down and I think that's related to organics but this uh, this idea that organic food is healthier which is an idea they love to promote and in certain circumstances may be true but on the whole it's just that it's a lower yield and that it hasn't been subjected to, for example, intensive irrigation techniques, which just dilute the taste. But to me, I've I've got no problem with organic farming, apart from the fact that if you ask most people in the street what their perception of organic farming is, they would say no fertiliser, no pesticides and no drugs. And to my mind, my knowledge of it, which I would admit is less than yours, that's just not true. And I object to it i think it's wrong they should market it as it is and that i actually believe that a more sustainable method of farming is not your intensive factory farming at the other extreme it's somewhere in the middle and it depends on what soil you're on and what method you're trying to well let's get to the nitty-gritty so you've spent your year traveling around the world trying to find out sustainable methods of organic agriculture. What was the conclusions, dear heart? 
The conclusion was that the organic sector and the conventional sector need to talk about best practice more and discuss where the future of food production goes and the most sustainable methods of doing that. So I saw some fantastic examples of people really understanding their soils, understanding how production works in a natural base system but not being organically certified. And where technology comes into this, we hear more about genetic modification And in some ways, the organic sector would benefit most from GM technology because if you had a potato that was resistant to blight, then that solves the biggest production conundrum about producing organic Mm. potatoes. Mm. Or if you had a a wheat that could fix atmospheric nitrogen, remembering that most of the air around us is nitrogen. you sat there going, "Mm, I'm not having that. (laughs) (laughs) You are full of... She dropped the GM bomb. (laughs) (laughs) It is, it is, yeah. It is, they're on the street. One thing thing that we missed here, we've completely missed in this argument, is the fact that we're talking about food production per se and, and qualities and quantities. We're not... We haven't addressed the, the need to enhance our landscapes and our quality of life is off the back of that. You know, we, there's so much more to, to good farming practice than just food production, isn't there? I mean, how much of the land mass in the UK is farmed? 80%? I don't know the figure. I did discover that during Roman times it was much higher than it is now. Right. Well, I think it's probably around about 80%. So if you consider all that landscape... Now, when you, when you, when you think, as Nikki was talking about and Kareen... Uh, to a degree that the health of, about the health of the soil now soil for instance as we've said before is responsible for things such as the sequestration of, of greenhouse gases and of course there is evidence that conventional agriculture does tend to uh, knock down the, the health of the soil to the extent where its bacterial content is impoverished and that the no. sequestration of greenhouse gases is compromised off the back of some of those no. activities so and, and obviously you know uh, climate change is at the forefront of everyone's minds and it will affect humanity and every living thing on the planet. But it's very difficult to say that you can put more land back into production and any further land we put into production is going to be to the detriment of the environment now because, yeah. because we've built over it or we've changed it. There's very little new land that can come in. That's absolutely yeah. right. It's, it's so important. Want- to be sympathetic with the land that we do farm. I think people have just come so disassociated from their food and realising how it's produced. If everyone grew their own vegetables, they'd realise how precious they were yeah. and they wouldn't waste so much. And if we didn't waste so much, then we wouldn't need to grow so much. Well done. Right. And, of course, you can buy those vegetable plug plants or seed from... <laughs> oh, yeah. Wiggly Wigglers! Yeah, and jolly, <laughs> jolly good they are too. Listen, we have to conclude this do we podcast. Have, I've just started um, to think but that's we're just come, a spot to stop. We're going to come yeah. back next week to have a short interview with Nikki about that GM bombshell because we just can't leave that there. You know, GM is such a taboo subject that we've just got to have you back on the sofa. But in the meantime, Nikki, if you were going to set up a farm, would you have an organic farm or not? I'd be looking for a unique product rather than mass production. And it's probably easier to have something that's unique if it's organic and so it gives me a unique selling point and I'd look for something a little different to just mass producing wheat I don't I don't want to be in the mass production I want to enjoy learning about that land and understanding it Um, and lastly I've forgotten to ask you about leaf was leaf in your study, linking environment and farming? I visited some leaf farms both <coughs> in the UK and in Kenya and I think it's a fantastic scheme because farmers are auditing themselves and trying each year to take a positive step forward to do something more sustainable or in a more environmentally efficient manner and leaf are a fantastic organisation because they're promoting these factors and educationally informing many other people and school children about how farming and the environment are linked and they are intrinsically linked but people have separated food and the environment. Thank you very much. Thanks to Kareen for that um, <laughs> lovely French accent especially but also your input in terms of your own farm. Nikki, we'll see you next week. Yeah. 
Farmer Phil and Ricardo, I cannot believe you. You have turned into wibbly wobbly, weak will slobber I think we, do, we don't want to show Ricardo's the one. I mean, look at him <laughs> sat there. Oh, yeah, I we'll have GM. You just, you've become complete softies. It's a total transformation. If you could come every ni- week, Nikki, and that would be brilliant. And it's goodbye from us. If you get a chance to give us a review, We'd love you to do so on iTunes or if you email us, we'll pop it up on the blog. Until next week, we leave you and love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.